Well, hello, good people. Welcome to part four of how not to make a propeller. Before we do any bludgeoning or bodgery today, we need to have a look at the drawings. Of course, I realized using Eric's book that I'm actually not entirely following it in a logical fashion. That's because I used a template and knew the size and diameter of the propeller from the one that my friend has in South Africa. It doesn't matter. We're now at page 12 and we're looking at blade angles. This is Eric's diagram. To derive the blade angles, we don't actually use any maths at all. It's all done by geometry. So I've made my own version of that drawing. I don't know why I did it the other way around. Basically, up the side of here is propeller pitch. That is the propeller's movement forward, sort of relying on zero slip in one revolution. This bottom line is two things. It's the circumference of the propeller, but it's also the radius blade stations in percentage. Now, there was an amazing bit of luck for me. Obviously, to get the circumference, I take the diameter of the propeller and times it by pi, 3.14, 15926, heaven only knows what. If I take the propeller at 1600 millimeters diameter and multiply that by pi, I end up with 5026. So I rounded that down to five, which is five meters. So it's one meter in pitch, five meters in circumference. This has made this drawing incredibly easy. So to produce the blade angle, we merely take a line from any reference point we want along the bottom, along the circumference line, up to the pitch line here. So in our case, I've just got a one meter line. Now I use this paper, this is good stuff. Square paper, every square is two millimeters. It's got a sort of one and two centimeter markers on it. That goes in my flying bag that I cart around the world. And so any hotel room I'm in and I want to produce ridiculous drawings of silly ideas, then I can just use that stuff. The nice thing is you don't need to take much drawing stuff with you. Merely a, a small ruler is enough and you can sketch away to your heart's content. Not sure whether it prevents madness or encourages it anyway. It's what I do. So in the case of this drawing, I've taken every 10% line. And of course, these, these percentage points are the points also marked on here, on this blade profile that we made in part one. Now, for instance, the 10% is a bit of a waste of time because it's almost it's just outside of a propeller bolt. There's no profile there as such whatsoever. It's all tree. And likewise, the 20% is really not much more interesting. So. Although I ran lines from every 10% mark, I actually ran a few extra ones, places that were more interesting. For instance, 35% on the blade profile I'm using is interesting because this blade that I'm using as a sort of constructional guide, if you like, in terms of copying key features of it, although my pitch is slightly different, this blade is full thickness up to 35%. In fact, again, because it's a, the propeller that fell to earth, 35% is there. And I can scribble all over it to my heart's content, which is very useful. So I, I picked 35%, then 50%, 75%, and the tip. Once the blade stations have been chosen, then the drawings can be prepared for those stations. Now, again, this blank was terribly useful because as well as just giving the sort of drawing around profile, I can stick lots of information on it. So I chose 100%, so that's 60 mil wide. 75% is 119 mil wide. 50% is 138 millimeters wide. And then our 35% marker was 137. The first drawing I did was the 100% station. That's the tip. It was the easiest to do, but more importantly, it was the good way of sort of getting into the drawings. Of course, measured on the blank, the tip is 60 millimeters wide, and of course all the blanks 75 mil high or three inches. What this allows me to do is mark the blank front and back, and actually I mark the end, I mark the square on the tip. So I can start marking the lines fore and aft here for the trailing edge and part of the leading edge as well. This is the 75% station. Again, full 75 mil high, although the blank will be tapered down as 
which is cut out, 119 wide. And these measurements here allow me to mark the blank for cutting the blade back and the blade front. That says marked by me on here. So some people actually say the back of the blade is, is the curved bit and the face of the blade is the bit that does the work. Anyway, we're not going to get muddled up. That's front, that's back. Um, and it allows me to mark up the, the blank because what I need to do is attack it with a saw. Here we are, Dale. Here's a hacksaw, although I'm not going to use it today. Maybe another day. I'll use a tenon saw, I think. Likewise, that's the 50% station with a sort of aerofoil drawn in and the guidance for marking up the blank. I also did the 35% station. Now that's slightly tricky because you can go sort of flat blade or flat back of the blade. So here, these are flat, that's flat. And I'm, although the twist is slightly different on the blade each time, of course that angle is taken from this diagram. And I merely measured it, that's something I meant to say earlier, I merely measured it by counting across and up using the squares. So I didn't use any kind of um, protractor or even angled tool to, to mark that out. I merely carefully counted using a ruler. Of course, metric ruler on this is lovely because the squares all line up and, and derive the drawings that way. This 35% station is a bit more tricky. We know it's a full height blank. And obviously the blade profile around 35% is not going to be flat on the back, it's going to be slightly curved. So of course I've had to mark the, the, the straight line fairly far out, knowing that I'm actually gonna sort of tickle more off that way and more off that way with the saw before I start chiseling. I just sort of have to live with that. Anyway, those are the only four I've done. And then I marked up the propeller blank. I spent quite a long time yesterday marking this up and I decided not to turn the camera on because it took a while and I just wanted to do quite a lot of thinking. So I'll take you through what I did. The first thing to do, and Eric warns about this in his book, is to mark the blank up. So I've got it marked front, leading edge, leading edge, and then on the other side, I keep it on a couple of wooden blocks. It's easier to manhandle rather than just put it flat on the bench. Back, back, trailing edge, trailing edge. You need to identify fairly quickly and reliably what way round the propeller is. Because if you end up cutting it all out the wrong way around, then you might end up with a propeller that's a bit, well, a bit Philip Schofield, I suppose. We don't want a pusher. The other thing I marked on it straight away was direction of rotation, because that is fairly obvious. I mean, it's an American engine. I know it's the Praga engine, but it's a copy of an Aronka engine. So it turns widow shins at the front. So I marked it that way. Obviously, if you're standing behind the prop, if you're propping it like a seaplane, then it turns clockwise. So I did that to start off with. In fact, we'll leave it on the back because I'll show you something else I did. I keep referencing this single bladed propeller, how useful it is too. And I think you can actually see here, see that sort of flat portion there, a little bit further up. That's where it's full width up to about 35% cord of 35% span rather or diameter whatever you want to call it radius it's only got one blade it can't have a diameter and same on the front so to start off with and I saw someone else making a propeller on YouTube doing this not Elena but someone else carving one out at home which was quite clever marked the blade up of course you want to mark that the same each way so I made myself a a cardboard template now I I actually dropped that on, put a couple of bolts in it, and then I could line up very accurately the holes here. So I dropped that on there and marked the circle, or marked the, the radius, I suppose, and then did it the other way around as well, and then marked it up to the 35% line. Great continuity there. Having marked up the end of the tip here, so that's the leading edge there, trailing edge there, I didn't draw any kind of... Uh, um, Aerofoil section on doesn't matter at the moment. I then ran a line up from the trailing edge bottom of the section to that 35% line. And then I ran another line because Eric says the trailing edge will sort of allow 
three sixteenths of an inch, five millimeters effectively. So I ran a five mil line up as well. So that's the trailing edge marked out, and I did likewise on the other side. Oh, let's bash the camera over. There we are. So that's both trailing edges and the ends of the tips marked up. The leading edge isn't quite so easy, although it's not too difficult once I sort of got my head around it. Just to recap, there's the trailing edge is sort of this is the trailing edge and there's where we would effectively cut from so we have a line going under the blank at the moment and it comes out here at that 35 percent mark and so what we're going to do with the saw is cut in using the trailing edge line the upper one in this case and a line i've derived on the top here which is the back of the leading edge if i use this half blade again Again, this is just a cutting line. It's not the finished item. There's going to be lots of extra bludgeoning to get that. We're cutting probably every inch or so, Eric recommends, to, to form this back sort of face of the, of, the, of the blade from the trailing edge up to the leading edge. And of course, because of the, the twist on this, effectively, there's the least, least pitch at the tip, obviously. And because this, this bit's rotating slower, it has more pitch on it. So the twist on the blade is increasing as we get towards the root. And so I plotted the 75% line. The 50% line, actually, it's, it's a bit further in, but I've decided I'm not going to be too wild because I can always remove more material than I can put it on easily. And then the 35% line is there, which I'm on the line. So I'm actually slightly behind the line there anyway, knowing I might have to thin the blade off a bit more. But I think that's the best I can do. I actually marked that with a piece of ribstock. I remembered up on the up on the shelves here. I've got some ribstock, so I've marked that up with ribstock. This line here, which again starts at thirty-five percent because it's where the blade finishes being full width, is effectively the taper of the blade, and I've marked that line on both sides. So that's marked there, and it's marked on the trailing edge side. So. Once this thing is bolted down, I'm going to cut, um, let's get this right. Yes, I'm cutting down and then I'm going to be cutting, that's right, I'm going to be cutting level just down to that taper line on each side. Now, the one thing I didn't say about was, was marking the top. Obviously, the blade gets thicker and has more twist as it gets to the, to the root. So actually, to cut from the other trailing edge line to the top line here. I'm actually going to cut through the top of the blank rather than from the front, otherwise I'm just going to be you know, cutting it far too thin. So this line here is, and again the 35, 50 and 75 are, are taken from my drawings I did. These are the limits for cutting that way and meeting the top trailing edge line. Now for this last one of course the blade thins out here and effectively I can cut down to there when I get close to the tip. So there, that to there is a nonsense line, really. I just sort of finished it somewhere. I'm just terribly aware that I can always cut off more than I can stick back on. Likewise, as we get towards the root, there's going to be very little blade. Again, the book, Eric says that inside of 30, 30% 30 should be regarded as fairing for cooling purposes, not actually anything particularly useful in terms of creating thrust. So the thrust is created in this sort of outer 70%. So that's where we'll concentrate on, on decent blade. And the rest of it will concentrate on decent profile, not looking too stupid. So I think that's it marked up. The last thing I've done, actually just before bludgeoning commences, is to make a little thing. It's That's a nice piece of beech log. I'm slowly helping a beech tree come home from up the road. It's a great chunk that's fallen over and uh, I keep attacking it with my bow saw every time I go on a dog walk and bits of it come home. They'll be fed to the stove in the winter. It's not seasoned enough yet, but uh... anyway, that's just to hold the propeller down. So if I bolt that on, like so, the idea is Do this up nice and tight. Then if I move the wooden bits out of the way, 
drop the hole blank on there. And it goes over the nice piece of beach in the middle. And uh, hold it down with a nut and a washer, like so. So rather than keep having to clamp it to the bench with various G clamps and all the rest of it, it's now held down nice and tight. So I just need a saw now. I've got a couple of saws to choose from. I was toying with the idea of using this one. It's sharp as anything. And it's got enormous teeth though. It's a bit like Janet Street Porter. And I thought it might be a bit splintery. So I'm actually going to use this instead. It's got much smaller teeth. It's nice and sharp though. It's a tenon saw or a back saw. I think the other advantage with this is that when I'm cutting the level bits on the thinning down the, the leading edge, which is actually on the other side, because this is the trailing edge I'm going to start on, then it's easy to see if it's level because it's a parallel section blade. Well, that worked very well. It's right on the line fore and aft. So I'm just going to gently go along and cut all of those. I'm not going to film it though, and mess around. There's quite a lot to do. So I'll turn the camera on again once this is cut and ready to turn over. It's taken about an hour to cut this trailing edge side down, both lots. The saw is excellent. I'm really pleased to use this saw. Um, excellent control with it because it's a uh, it's very easy to sort of put just a little bit of weight on the on the back of the saw there and then just sort of nibble it down to the to the right amount it's down to the line each side i've pretty much come down to the line the reason being all the things i've read about people making homemade propellers the one regret is they're always a bit thick in section so i've decided i'll be a bit bold and come down to the line so now i can unbolt it and turn it over Right, that's the right way around, because I want to go down like that now. I'm going to be going down like that, and when I get to the bit where it's thinned out here, I'm going to go level down, but only once I've done the cuts that way. So better tighten this up again. Funny the things you only notice when you actually start doing a job. You can sort of think about things for hours on end and then some practical issues arise. Not difficult, but I need to cut down that away. Obviously, I'm going to do it uh, at the bench on the other side as such. So I'm not sort of leaning over the bench here. But if you look here, I've got to cut right down to that line there. There's no way I can do that very easily at the height this is. So I'm going to make a couple of packing pieces to go under the blade and... I'll extend that studding. Fortunately, the studding is quite a bit longer under there. So I'm just going to go and find some MDF and chop it up and put some packing on. Right, well, I'm going to carry on cutting out, same as before. I'll turn the camera on once it's done.
Well, that's the last cut. And so the next job is to start bludgeoning and actually knock all of this off with our hammer and chisel. Um, it's Sunday evening, it's heading for six o'clock. I'm gonna stop at that and I'm gonna carry on in the morning and there will be another episode out on Friday. As always, thank you for watching.